Wow, I mean, these people, in order to survive, in order mm. to do business, they are willing to go anywhere. Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 97 of the Impulsive Podcast by Momentum Works. So on this week's episode, we're going to do something a little different. So those of you who have watched us for a while, you know that we used to do kind of like weekly commentaries, weekly recaps, and people have been requesting that we bring it back so that we can cover a wider range of more recent topics. Don't worry, we will still do in-depth episodes, but we've also just decided to bring back the weekly commentaries so that we have a little more up-to-date podcast, right? So for the first topic of today... As we are recording this, it's the 6th of November, around lunchtime. Everybody is eagerly waiting for the final results of the US elections. The last time we checked, which was two minutes ago, is tilting towards a certain candidate, right? And I think by the time you watch this, uh, hopefully the election results will be fully out. I mean, for me, it feels like we have been like watching a reality show for the last year, six months, eight months. It's a long time. And every other day, somebody's asking, hey, um, who do you think would win the US election? Um, my answer is that I don't know. <laughs> we will know soon. <laughs> Yeah, I think by the time you watch it, hopefully that you already know. I, I think the issue like for, for, for lots of people, especially for us in Asia, is that we are in, in a world where lots of things are happening and there are lots of risks and there are lots of like, uncertainties. I was having a reunion with my MBA classmates uh, after 10 years and people were saying that, oh, when we graduated in 2013, everybody was talking about globalization. Mm -mm. Nobody talks about that anymore. I think the world is very different. Regardless, I mean, people, people need to live on, right? So it's, it, I think it's just like when people ask us how do you think about the state of the economy in China? So, of course, I mean, it's the sentiment is bad. But, uh, but many people, I mean, they have businesses to run. They have people to, on their payroll and they have responsibilities to, to make. So people find ways to adjust to the reality. And I'm not sure if you watched that interview with Li Xianlong. So somebody asked him a question. I mean, how does he see the geopolitics if Trump or Harris would be uh, elected. I think his answers were al along the lines of, it probably doesn't matter. Right? History has said that, that there, there's some big dynamics going on and, and there's lack of mutual trust. And, um, and, and regard, regardless of who gets elected, um, I, think, I think the big direction is probably going towards a certain way. Uh, it's just um, <laughs> how that manifests, right? Whether it's manifested in a in a slow, steady, sure way, or with this mentality in, in a very turbulent way. The way we think about it, we don't know. And these few days, I've had lots of discussions with lots of the cross-border sellers uh, in China. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, everybody's eagerly looking at the results because they fear about potential tariffs. Many people historically moved their production to Vietnam, to Mexico, to, to avoid the tariffs. And, uh, and of course, if you look at some of the narratives uh, from the Trump campaign, they're saying that if somebody is using this kind of loopholes to get around the trade barriers, they will enact rules to say that, okay, maybe certain things mm. imported from Vietnam, certain things imported from Mexico will no longer have the pre preferred tariffs. But the reality is that you have thousands of, thousands of businessmen who are trying to figure out I mean, how to navigate, and they will find ways. Uh, yesterday I was talking to, to someone, he knows a business from China, who, who recently set up in, in, a, in a state of Paraguay. Do you know where that is? No. South America. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's a country, and, and he checked the country has no diplomatic relationship with China. And, and he said, wow, I mean, these people, in order to survive, in order mm. to do business, they are willing to go anywhere. I think that's interesting, right? Because like what you say, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter as much who wins the elections because most of these businesses have already started preparing for alternative ways yep, that yep, they can... Yep. I mean, if you think about the reason that there's also talk about, about Temu, right? I mean, there's also the potential US reversal of the, the, the tax-free treatment mm. for certain parcels. And if you look at the, some of the cross-border players, I mean, Temu has been preparing for that for like more than half a year. They are forcing more merchants to send goods directly from the US. So, so people know all these scenarios. They're preparing for it. Obviously, certain people would um, face challenges, but, uh, but there are people who, are, who, who, who will be able to figure out I mean, how to navigate this. But I think it's not just businesses that are looking at these geopolitical issues, right? Definitely governments mm -hmm. around the world are also concerned because it would impact their relationships with others. A couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. President Xi Jinping actually met with the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi. Yes, in Russia. In Russia, <laughs> right, where they discussed a little bit about their mm -hmm. relationships as well. Obviously, there's a big concern amongst the people who are I mean, allied with the U.S. over the last few years that if, I mean, if Trump 
gets, gets elected, which by this time you already know who would be the winner. Things will not be smooth amongst the U.S. and its allies. And India historically has been uh, hedging space, right? Even mm. though the U.S. wants to create the Quad, the sort of alliances of de democracies or whatever that is called, India has been putting gas from Russia and they're trading a lot with China. Before this recording, I, I checked uh, the numbers between, of the trade between India and China. So over the last five years, it effectively doubled. We know that in 2020, there was a like a border skirmish, mm -hmm. and a few people, died, a few soldiers died, mm -hmm. and uh, that caused, uh, I think, a big rupture in the relationship. Uh, so it's it's now pretty practically impossible for Chinese business businessmen to get a visa to travel to India, and uh, India banned almost all the Chinese apps. But if you look at the trade, it has it has been booming. And so China is now India's largest uh, trading partner, and of course, since the the sign of, uh, of potential stimulus from Chinese government of the last year. You see a effect of uh, of capital moving very quickly to Hong Kong from India. So uh, I don't know exactly exact magnitude, but uh, but if you read the Financial Times this week, it says that uh, the withdrawal uh, of capital by foreign investors from the Indian stock market has re reached a historical high. So we are in a state where uh, a lot of shifts are happening. I think the governments are hedging their bets. So investors are moving away from the India Stock Exchange? Foreign investors. Foreign investors yeah. are moving away. Yeah. And then to Hong Kong Stock Exchange? Not exactly only to Hong Kong, but they're moving away from, from India. If you, if you listen to some of the some interviews by some of the US hedge funds, they said, okay, we're going all in, in Hong Kong, all in into China. A lot of things which seems very certain, but because of some trigger point, and it could actually could shift very, very quickly. Over the last few years, we have talked to a lot of Indian executives because for many of them, I mean, especially in tech business platforms, e-commerce, etc. They look to China for experience because no, nobody else has that scale. <laughs> yeah, I would say that there's a lot of similarities. There are some similarities in terms of the amount of skill and demand that you can have based on India and China, right? Just because mm. of the population. But of course, yeah, the something I think similar, we've yeah. mentioned about mm. is that obviously it's different. Mm. It's still different, right? In China, everyone speaks a common language. Mm. In India, there's... 18? 20, 20, 20, 23, 23 remember, official 20, languages? Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of similarities in terms of how we do know um, from Indian companies that we spoke to, they look a lot to China in terms mm. of how they could potentially grow in the market, right? Mm. But I think they've also acknowledged that obviously there are a lot of different cultural differences and infrastructure differences as well between the different cities cities in India. I think different cities in China are different as well. What, what I find particularly, particularly powerful is that, I mean, if you look at many of the Indian companies, they are dealing with challenges probably far greater than the, the companies in China had to deal with historically. Mm. Infrastructure, I mean, the diversity. But, but there are also other, th other areas where India is essentially leapfrogged, right? I mean, the soft infrastructure, the, the ID system, the payment gateway, etc., etc. I do think that for lots of Indian businesses, I mean, looking at the reference points from China, and they know India market better than anybody else, right? I mean, they, they are looking for inspiration of what, how they can potentially do things. I have a friend, a uh, Chinese entrepreneur, who, who lived in India for like one in 10 years. He's now in Singapore, and, and he regularly talks with friends coming from India, and he's still very passionate about the country. So I, I think there's a lot of desire for exchange. We were in EU, right, mm. uh, two weeks ago, the trade center for China. We, we went to this small store. The Sao Tai Mao store, right? The, the one with the, the cats, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, the so basically, they, they have this like small figurine of astronaut, uh, like waving a flag, and they have two of them, like one of, the, one of them waving the Indian flag, one of them waving the Chinese flag. I said, okay, haven't seen this for a long time. And one of the participants who's from India actually bought one of this. That reminds me of something which was said in the 1950s, right? I mean, it's like Hindi, Chini, bye bye, right? It's like India and China were brothers. Mm -hmm. I do think that moving forward, there's still a lot of um, room for collaboration. There will be lots of competition for sure, mm. and there will be lots of sagas, right? Because, I mean, if you look at some of the business business collaborations, some of the competition, that the fallout can be quite drastic. <laughs> but still, I mean, look at overall trade. I mean, the businesses are, are voting with the trade, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In less political news, mm -hmm. <laughs> another one of the topics that we want to talk about in our weekly recap is more... It's related to something a little more relatable in terms of the coffee scene. Mm. So recently, Starbucks actually released their Q4 earnings. So they follow so they, a different earnings cycle. So their financial year ends uh, end of September? September, okay. yeah. So okay. in their Q4 earnings, what they shared was actually that they saw a net revenue decline by 3% quarter on quarter. Globally? 
globally. This is something we've seen happening over the past few quarters as well. We yeah. know that their sales have been dropping. Yeah. So we did an episode where we talked about their new CEO and a little bit more about Starbucks revenue. So mm. you guys can check that out in the show notes below if you're yeah. interested. Yep. But I think what we want to focus a little bit more on this week is talking about some of the changes that the new CEO, Brian Nicole, is implementing, right? Mm -hmm. what is and doing? what this means for Starbucks. What is he doing? So essentially what he said in the earnings call is that he wants to go back to Starbucks. Mm. And he, some of the changes he's making, for example, is removing the extra $1 charge for adding oat milk and almond milk. Okay. I think um, he's heard complaints from on the ground of people wondering why there's extra charges for this. Mm. They've also decided to add a self-service station for cream and sugar. Mm. And I think one of the main things that I've been seeing online generally is also a lot about Starbucks mobile orders. Mm. So a couple of articles out there have stated that Starbucks has recently shifted to from more of a predominantly sit-down coffee chain mm. to mostly drive-through and mobile takeout orders. Mm -hmm. And they feel that this is one of the reasons why Starbucks is not performing as well. And they also feel that these online orders are taking away the value proposition of Starbucks because mm -hmm. the staff are mm -hmm. unable to engage with customers and give them the customer experience that is expected of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So this is something that the media has been saying, mm -hmm. at least based on headlines, right? Mm -hmm. That essentially Starbucks mobile takeout chain mm -hmm. might be the reason why Starbucks isn't, hasn't been doing as well the previous few quarters. Mm -hmm. But your face looks like you disagree with that. How do you think the point that, that, that you just mentioned, right? Removing that $1 mm. extra charge for the for the alternative milk. I, I, I personally feel that, uh, I mean, going to Starbucks to, to order is actually quite tiring. Because there's too many options. So there was... There's so many things to think about. Yeah, there was that Bloomberg it. report. There are like 30, 388 million ways. 388 think, yeah, million I, ways I, for I, a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Was that in the, Millions or billions, but there are lots of ways, yes. lots of ways to customize. And obviously, when you try to communicate this verbally to the barista, that adds to lots of stress, right? Because I mean, they need to remember this very, very carefully, mm -hmm. and they need to uh, prepare the drinks according to whatever you have asked. So that adds to the operational complexity. Even if you are ordering through mobile, I mean, that mobile experience, to be honest, I mean, it's not the best. We have lucky and others to compare. Is it's, it's not the best. But it, they keep the same level of complexity in their mobile ordering as well. So it's not really like... It's a little more simplified, obviously. You can't go to the barista and tell them like, oh, I want like two pumps of chocolate syrup in this. But the level of complexity is still there, right? You can choose like whipped cream, your sweetness level and all. Mm. So there's still a lot of customization from their mobile app. Mm. And I think because of the level of customization that Starbucks has in general, this affects the operational efficiency of their employees, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How quickly can you make a drink where every drink is so different as compared to Luckin? I would think that will make uh, the recruitment part more complicated, right? To train a Starbucks employee, I think, takes two days. And I also think about that to recruit a barista for Luckin is easy, right? I mean, you don't require certain skills. Mm. You don't require them to remember so many things. You don't require them to put a very nice the sort of customer-facing personality. But with the, with the Starbucks, it's different, right? I mean, they require hell a lot of like skills and, and traits of the mm. baristas. And with all this complication, it, it makes delays. And the second is that uh, it really limits the, the talent pool that they can tap into. Mm. I mean, there, there are people who, who are very good with people, and uh, they might not be as good as you know, following very, trip. very precise processes. So, so, so these are different, different skill sets. But I think it's also, so then the problem is not really that they're doing mobile orders, right? It's in terms of how does Starbucks manage the operational efficiency. Mm. But that brings me back to what Brian said about going back to Starbucks. Mm. Operational efficiency was never really the value proposition of Starbucks, right? Mm. Their value proposition was always customer experience and providing a third place. But I think these two are not contradicting it's each other, right? Because no. when you are efficient... <laughs> you can provide a nicer... I mean, the baristas have yes. more sort of... Uh, I mean, we, we don't have to remember all these like extra requests in your mind and, and, and remember typing the right things. And you have more sort of uh, energy to actually engage with the customers. So I think these two are should be in harmony and they should not be like contradicting each other. So I don't think it's the fact that Starbucks is unable to provide a good customer experience, but rather at this point, they kind of... They are unable to juggle between balancing the mobile orders as well as their in-store customer service. I, I do think that they have made uh, the operation a little bit too complicated. A little too complicated. I mean, of course, like, if you have like 388 million, billion ways to make a coffee, mm -hmm. and you have food as well. Basically, there are lots of things that the baristas need to take care of, so, so actually it's not an easy job. And I mean, it's not just North America that Starbucks isn't doing well in, mm -hmm. right? One of their 
worst performing markets based on their latest results was actually China. Mm. Yeah, so their store sales declined by about 14% mm. quarter on quarter mm. in China. But, but this is something we've talked about in previous podcasts as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that they haven't been doing well. And mm. in China, of course, there are a lot of stronger players that thrive in operational efficiency, like mm. Luckin Coffee, mm -hmm. who is also actually planning on expanding into the US. So, so, that, so, that, so that's according to a, to a Financial Times report, right? Yes. Saying that, okay, Luckin is planning to, 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 to open up in the US. US. And Luckin, so Luckin only started their global expansion about a year and a half ago. Mm. So Singapore was their first stop. Now mm. they have about 40 plus stores. Mm. I don't think they're profitable yet. Luckin's report, they admitted that in their earning conference, right, mm. that judging from their early exploration in Singapore, mm. although there were certain financial losses, mm. it was still a valuable experience for them because it helped them realize the complexity of overseas businesses. So I think they have not found a way to be profitable, probably, for the overseas market. But mm. it has helped them realize that obviously the Singapore market is very different, right? Luckin is a coffee store where you have to order mainly through your app. Whether, and especially Singapore has a more diverse coffee scene, we also have our cheap coffee. So the mass coffee strategy that Luckin used in China might not work so, as well. So basically they said in earnings call. Right? Yeah, that so there what, were what financial losses, mm. but it was good experience for them. And now they've, I think with this experience, they've decided that they want to try other markets as well. Mm -hmm. So Hong Kong is the next one that they are entering. Mm -hmm. And then potentially maybe also the US. I took a look at the Luckin's financial report for last year. So it clearly laid out, I mean, how much investment they were making to, to basically acquire, renovate uh, the stores and pay the rent and stuff. But I think at the gross level, they were okay. I'm not sure about what, what happened this year because they have not exactly announced the breakdown. Mm -hmm. But I do think that for a company like Luckin, which has 20,000 stores, Singapore is not a market for them to prove anything financially, but it's something to prove to people that okay, they can manage sort of a, a multinational operation. There are voices in the market saying that okay, they have confirmed the deal to enter Malaysia. And some people are speculating whether they should go to Malaysia, whether they should go to Vietnam, Indonesia, Laos, etc. But what's the point, right? In Indonesia, you have a few homegrown, like sort of tech network mm -hmm. coffee players, and after six, seven hundred stores, they find it hard to expand any further. I mean, Starbucks has like, what, a few hundred? Less than, less than 1,000 stores yeah. in, in Indonesia. So the market might not be as big as you potentially think. But the U.S. is a different story, mm. right? I would think it's quite plausible for, for Luckin to open another 20,000 stores in the U.S. If they manage to figure out how to manage that operations mm. as well as they are doing in China. It will be challenging, but at least from a story point of view, it's possible for them to double their store count and with a market which can potentially be more profitable. But Luckin is not the only Chinese coffee chain that's growing very rapidly, right? Mm. Two weeks ago, yeah. we released an article called Coty Opens 10,000 Stores. Mm. So Coty Coffee is the coffee chain started by the original founders of, of Luckin, Luckin Coffee, Coffee who were kicked out who got kicked out because mm. of you know a lot of things and then Coty Coffee recently celebrated their second anniversary mm. where they opened its 10,000 stores so this is they opened 10,000 stores in two years yeah, so for reference Luckin opened 4,500 stores in two years so this is I, almost I, double, I, I, but it's a very different model. So Luckin is very self-operated, yeah, right? Yeah, so I, I don't know. People people like to draw this kind of comparisons, like but Luckin was like before the pandemic, like 2017, or whatever. So Coty when it started, for them to choose a place to open stores, very simple. Like okay, there's Luckin, so I will go to Coty next door. That's a strategy that many Chinese players have have been using. So. I look at the some of the retail businesses from China expanding overseas. What's their strategy? So for instance, I'm a retailer of a fashion brand and I come to Singapore, go to Malaysia. If there's Giordano, I will go on next door. How many malls are there in Singapore where there's still a Giordano? Quite a few. And I was surprised. And when you go to the Middle East and you go to Africa, you have Giordano's. And, and in Singapore, there's another brand called G2000. Honestly, it's, it's, it's a very boring brand. I mean, it's just, but they're surviving. So, so, so many of these this stores, Strategies that okay, I, I look at those G thousand. Obviously, they are they are surviving, and uh, they're they're probably profitable. I open store next to them because I have better products, I have cheaper products, I have better supply chain. I I sort of change my assortment once every two weeks. G two thousand probably doesn't. So they're leveraging sort of this second mover advantage, right? So, yeah. So the, so yeah. my point is that when you say like the quality open faster than nothing, I mean it doesn't make sense because when Nakin started, he was trying to figure out this model. When Cody started... They had already. Yeah, they, they just go... Yes. There's a Nakin, okay. Yeah. The, the, the Nakin must have done their studies and that there must be room for coffee 
uh, in this particular country, let's open court next to it. Do you think Luckin would use a similar strategy in the US in terms of picking where to open their stores? If I were them, I would use that as a reference point at least. I don't think they would look at Starbucks, right? Starbucks definitely isn't a Why wouldn't they? direct competitor of Why Luckin. Wouldn't they? Different business model, no? If, okay, it depends on how they want to start in the US, whether or not they're going to position themselves as a mess and very fast, pick, so, and, pick up and go. So, so basically, if I see a, it's a big ass Starbucks here, I, I, I put a lucky next door with like you know, one fifth of the rent, hiring one fifth of the people, and, and people who are not as highly skilled as people at Starbucks. And then I sell, I sell drinks like half the price. At least I, I can take all the mobile orders that Starbucks is getting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that why not? Possible strategy. And, and, and of course, I mean, these guys will figure out their strategy based on their assessment of market. I'm just saying that this is one plausible pathway for them to expand. I think it's interesting when we look at all these Chinese F&B companies that are going global and expanding so quickly, right? Because mm. we know that the F&B business has kind of been tough the past few years. So we were looking at the Knight Frank report where they stated that in... Singapore. In Singapore, in nine months, almost... 2,500 F&B businesses have ceased operations. How much of that is uh, as a percentage of the total market? Do we know? We don't know, right? We Maybe don't know the specify. total market, so, yeah. I was in Changsha, I was speaking with uh, one of the local restaurant owners who has uh, like four different concept restaurants. And he was saying that if you open a restaurant in Changsha, if you survive for six months, that's already a great feat. So many of the places do not survive for six months. I think across Southeast Asia, we have not seen that level of competition. Even though some people say now it's very competitive, but, uh, but they probably haven't seen the level of competition in China. But we do see that Chinese brands are coming out just because of the level of competition in China. So mm. I think that would definitely affect how competitive this region becomes, right? Yeah, well, definitely, because uh, I, I think we calculated like 7,000 stores mm. uh, of F&B outlets by about 40 concepts, most of them Chinese, opened during uh, the first three years of the pandemic, or in, in, in the last three years. So, so obviously, we, ha we have so many of these outlets coming in, and not everyone will survive, but they will take some of the demand away, and, uh, and of course, creates competitive pressure from existing sort of uh, uh, operators yeah. in the market, right? So back to Koti, so they have uh, 10,000 stores, right? 10,000 stores. And, and, and they chose to open their 10,000 store in Doha. Doha. Yes. It shows that, uh, I mean, this is a very ambitious company. But what they want to do next, I find quite interesting. They're, they're saying that, okay, next year, they want to... Have 50,000 stores. From 10,000. And what's the strategy to achieve that? Instead of opening individual stores, they want to work with the convenience... Mm, convenience shops. Convenience shop. Personally, I find it interesting that, that they set such an aggressive target. But the way they do it... Um, sounds to me... Plausible way to grow so quickly at that scale. Because they're not operating most of these stores themselves, right? They're working with partners, they're working with franchisees. And of course, if you Costa does that in, a lot. Costa, Costa puts their sort of coffee machines mm. in the convenience stores and uh, mm. retailers and stuff. Um, and obviously, it helps the retailers, right? We have a branded sort of coffee experience there. It brings people there. People might buy other, other stuff. Mm. My curiosity is a couple of things. I mean, first, does that signify that uh, for Lucky itself to open more stores on its own or with its franchises, it has become more difficult? And second, what are terms you can possibly negotiate with all these people to, to, to place your brand within their stores? I would think that some of the larger concepts, like the, the, the convenience store chains, mm. would probably demand something from you. The majority of the, of the profit the sharing. Yeah, so. So, so that's a question mark. But still, I think it shows that... Uh, that They're that very ambitious. Mm. We shall see. Mm. In one year, <laughs> we'll do another podcast on whether or not Koti actually has 50,000 stores. I see you buy Lucky a lot. I don't see you buy Koti. Is that because there's no Koti? There's no Koti nearby. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's opportunity for Koti. I don't like Koti coffee. This is the um, tiramisu latte. It's really not nice. It's like the, 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 the Christmas one. So you were sharing an article about yeah. how... Yeah. Consumers in China were pouring the Luckin's toffee nut latte into the Starbucks cup, right? Mm. But I think that's the Starbucks brand, right? Mm. They will take photos and videos of themselves drinking with the Starbucks cup. Mm. So that shows that they view Starbucks as premium. a premium brand as mm. compared to Luckin coffee. Even though there were some comments that said that the Luckin coffee version tastes better. So Luckin has something similar, right? It's, it's the great. exact same drink. So it's also it's called coffee nut latte. I, I, I always struggle to, to understand these individual comments about the taste, right? I mean, when this coffee chains first came out, um, and I, I mean, imagine like when, before all this like Luckin, whatever came out, 
how many people will tell you that oh Starbucks taste sucks? I like this specialty coffee. At the end of the day, you see much more Starbucks than this whatever special <laughs> coffee that you you love. So it tells me possible two things, right? I mean, first, um, taste can be subjective. So Starbucks is probably going for the large denominator, right? So we create the experience, and it probably needs this coffee to not have such a strong taste so that it alienates some mm -hmm. audience. Most people will find it, okay, maybe a little bit boring, but acceptable. But I don't mind, like, you know, I need a cafe, I need to, like, sit down and talk to If someone. I need somewhere to sit down, if yeah, I need exactly. to have a meeting outside, that's Starbucks value proposition. Exactly. Someone in, I think the article you're sharing, they brought their Luckin coffee to Starbucks and then they poured it in a Starbucks cup mm. and then they sat down there. Mm. So I'm like, is that, but that's not, that cannot be good for Starbucks business, right? People are taking up space in your cafe. They're not even buying a drink from you. They're buying a drink from your competitor. Yes. I mean, that depends on how you view, view this, right? I mean, how, what kind of brand image you want to set. Living in Singapore, one thing which upset me greatly uh, during the pandemic, which, which caused me to never go to a particular coffee chain again, coffee bean tea leaf, is when you sit down, uh, with a laptop, before you even open it, they tell you, oh, laptop's not allowed to, to be um. used here. Of course, for them, it makes sense, right? They, they should have said that, okay, if people use laptops there, they sit for more than... Anything. There's a time limit. But that freaking store was empty. The staff is probably following protocol. Yes, but some protocols just don't make sense, and it shows detachment from realities. So is the uh, staff's complexity over all the strings, right? I mean, if you, if you spend time in the stores, and you'll probably see that, okay, and people find it too complicated. I don't think most people even order such complicated drinks, right? It's probably just a small percentage. Most people probably order the same few things every time they go to Starbucks. How many people are actually ordering like a different drink that has like 11 different combinations every time they go to Starbucks? Mm, I do not know, but I'm sure it complicates the operations because I mean, the staff need to be trained and if 10% of the people order like complicated drinks, that causes the process to be slower. I think this is definitely someone, something that Starbucks is going to think about, right? As they think about operational, like improving their operational efficiency and trying to bring back the customer value to their customers. But of course, I do think it's too early to tell. Brian Nicole only took over mm. a couple months back. Mm. We've seen Starbucks go through a similar journey before where they a kind of... Times, right? um, yeah, yeah, lost. Um, we don't know if Howard Schultz will come back. I think... <laughs> I think great companies really have been smooth selling, right? They go through crisis and each crisis makes them stronger. Mm. Also separately, another thing I like that the Starbucks, at least in Singapore, has, has done is that Wi-Fi used to ask you to, to either log in through Facebook or input your like email address mm -hmm. or phone number, which is I think I find completely useless because, I mean, of course, the argument is that you can collect data, but most people input fake data yes. because they have no mechanics to check whether the data is genuine or Did fake. they stop asking you? Yeah, they stopped. They now you just need to collect, connect, uh, the wi connect to Wi-Fi. That's good oh, enough. That's efficient. So this, this is just small things, right? That help you make it less troublesome for your consumers. I do think that there, there are lessons for, for any organization, right? You design something, you say, okay, data would be great. But if you don't collect the right data, you might as well not collect it. That's true. So I think that's all for this week's episode of the Impulsive Podcast. We hope that you guys enjoyed today's episode and also this new format of kind of like weekly commentaries, re recaps, where mm. we talk about different topics. Mm. If you do, do like our podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube to stay up to date on the latest happenings and trends in e-commerce, tech, new retail, and the broader digital economy. And Thank we you. don't always talk about politics. Yes. <laughs> Actually, we don't talk about politics. But, 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 but that, that, that's something which impacts everyone. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.